it is now officially 301 so let's get things started so today's webinar is sponsored by XWrite and on one and please visit their website you can learn a lot more about each company's offerings they both have a lot of great educational materials available there uh, include tutorials and downloads so definitely make uh, take advantage of what they have there and you have two sponsors today or two hosts today rather uh, my name is Joe Brady and together with Dan Harlicker from on one software we're your hosts for today's webinar I'm the webinar marketing manager for the Mac group and my job here is to create and deliver training programs for professional photographers. I own Dragonfly Studio in Tuxedo, New York with my soon-to-be wife Diane and I've been shooting portrait, wedding, and commercial photography for over 20 years and also teaching Photoshop for almost as long as well. Uh, Dan is responsible for the product design of On One's award-winning Photoshop, Lightroom, and Aperture plugins. He is also a professional photographer and owns Bliss Studio with his wife Whitney in Portland, Oregon. As working photographers, Dan and I both understand the need to work uh, both quickly and efficiently uh, while producing great results at the same time. For those of us that are spending countless hours in front of the computer, that's not making you any money. Uh, what your job is to do is to work efficiently so you can produce beautiful, finished, and unique work for your clients that will make you some money. So let's take a quick look at what we'll cover today to help make that happen. Uh, to start off, uh, Dan will begin by taking over where he left off last week. Uh, Dan, can you give us a quick synopsis of what you're going to show us today? Yeah, we'll kind of review what we started with last week. We'll go over doing some portrait retouching with photo tools, and then we'll take that finished image and we'll go into photo frame and we're going to create a layout, which would be an example of a page in a flush mount album. And then we'll also take that same image and we're going to prepare it for making a large gallery wrap wall portrait image using genuine fractals. Wonderful. And then after Dan is done, I will take over again uh, on the second half. And what I'm going to do is make sure that after all this beautiful work is done, that you can get a print that looks like it did on your monitor. So what I'm going to do is create a custom printer profile and show you how to put it to use. Uh, we'll do this back into Photoshop. I'm going to go over soft proofing, uh, which is where you get to see how your print uh, looks before you actually go out and print it. And I'll take the completed image that Dan has edited and check to see how it's going to look before we either print locally or <clears throat> uh, send it out to a lab. Now for local printing, I'll also cover the options in the printer dialog box and make sure that the printer driver isn't interfering with our color. Uh, and before we get started, Dan, a couple have mentioned that a couple of people have mentioned that your volume is very faint in relationship to mine. So if you could once again check your uh, your output volume. Check that little guy. It has a habit of changing itself. Yeah. Which it has yet again. Okay. The, blew that little preference. There we go. Hopefully that's better for folks. Yeah, it sounds much better to me as well. So everybody, uh, yes, everybody's saying okay. So uh, I'm going to turn the screen over to Dan, and he can take over. Bear with me one second here. So, Dan, I'm making you the presenter. Alrighty. And there we go. Okay. Hopefully, everybody can see Photoshop now. Yes, we're good to go. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. If you guys remember from last week's episode, <laughs> this is the image that we were working on. And we started off by making sure our camera was properly white balanced. And we built a custom profile for our camera using Passport. And then we processed it by applying that profile and a couple little tweaks in Adobe Camera Raw. Then we opened that image here into Photoshop. And let's show you where we started off with it here. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. And this is our original image out of the camera, properly color managed. So this is what it actually looked like in real life. Then in Photoshop, we just duplicated that image to its own layer and use the spot healing brush to just tackle some of these larger blemishes on her face. So we got a result that looked like this. So that's with those large blemishes removed. Then we sent that to Photo Tools and with Photo Tools we did some portrait retouching. Now Photo Tools is like Legos for Photoshop. It gives you over 300 effects or tools that you can preview and stack and control how they blend together. And you can use it on any kind of image but for our demonstration we were working specifically on a portrait doing some portrait retouching. And with that we were able to reduce the shine on her nose and on the right hand side of her face and then we also smoothed 
smoothed out the skin, and did some retouching of the eyes to clean up the whites of the eyes and to bring up the color. So let's show you the results of that right there. So those are our finished results after using photo tools. Let's go ahead. I'm just going to compare the bef overall before and after here real quick. So there's our original out of camera image. You can see the blemishes and the skin shine and the dull eyes. And then after our retouching in Photoshop and in photo tools. Now this image is we've done the retouching we would normally do and we could go ahead and crop it and make an 8x10 print or work on it uh, in a single print context but today we're actually going to show you how to use photo frame to create a layout from this. Now layouts are very popular and they're used in all sorts of different ways from promotional materials to albums. We're going to pretend today that we're making a single page in a flush mount album. The first thing we need to do is create a new canvas to work on because the image size doesn't match the paper size that we're going to work on. So in Photoshop, we'll go up to the File menu and we'll select New. From the New Image dialog, we're going to set our width and our height. Now, in a lot of times, it's going to be a common paper size, so you can get to that easily by going to the preset pop-up where it says Custom and selecting U.S. Paper and then select a size, in this case, letter size. So it gives us a width of 8.5 and, and a height of 11. In the resolution field, you're going to want to put in whatever resolution your service provider or your lab requires. 300 is a good rule of thumb, but they'll be able to tell you exactly what's needed. And I want to make sure that it's in color and in my working color space. In this case, I'm using Adobe RGB 1998. Then I'm just going to hit OK, and I'll create a new blank white empty page. That's a new page that we're going to work on. And you'll do this for every page that you're going to create. Now we need to get our image from the left-hand side onto our new canvas. And we're going to do that using the Move tool here in Photoshop. So I'm just going to make sure that I have the correct layer selected. I'm going to grab the version that we've done our retouching on. And then I'm just going to use the Move tool here in Photoshop and I'm just going to click and drag from one image to the other. Now this is easy to do when you have two images open in separate windows. Now with newer versions of Photoshop, it likes to put them into tabs. You can separate those tabs and make them floating palettes, or you can always use the copy and paste command in Photoshop to do the same thing. And if you're using this move technique that I'm showing here, here's a little tip. If you hold down the shift key on your keyboard when you drag from one document to another, when you release, it'll center the image in the new document instead of having it be off-centered. All right, I'm just going to get rid of our other image. We don't need it any longer. And let's focus just on our new canvas that we've created. Now you'll notice that the image is larger than the canvas size, and that's because the image that came out of the camera is actually larger than an 8.5 by 11. So we need to shrink this down so that it's taking up less space. There's a couple different ways that you can do that. The way that I like to do it is with the free transform tool. It allows you to not just change the size, but also the position and the rotation and even the perspective of an image layer. And you can access it from the Edit menu and select Free Transform. Or if you like keyboard shortcuts, you can use the Command T on a Mac or the Control T keyboard shortcut on Windows. So we're just going to turn that on. Now normally, if your layer size is smaller than the document, you'll actually be able to see resize handles at the four corners and along each side. But because our image is actually larger than our canvas, we don't see that, even though the Free Transform tool is active. So to size it, we're actually going to use the width and height fields up here in the top in the toolbar. Now, here's another great tip if you're a Power Photoshop user. First off, I'm going to click on the little lock icon. That'll lock the aspect ratio. So as I change the width, the height will change along with it. The other thing that's really handy is whenever in Photoshop you see a text entry field like these that will say 100%, if you bring your cursor right over the label, in this case the W for width or the H for the height, you notice how the cursor changes from the standard pointer to a little arrow or a little hand tool with arrows facing both directions. This is a great hidden feature in Photoshop called a scrubby slider. And if you click right there, you can now move your mouse to the left or to the right to increase or decrease the value in that field. So it's a very fast way to change those variables without having to type in and guess and check on a number. So I'm just going to shrink this down in size a little bit 
and hit the return key or the enter key on my keyboard to exit the free transform. So now our image fits our canvas in a more appropriate way for a layout. Now we're ready to send it to photo frame. To get to photo frame, I'm just going to use the on one panel over here on the right hand side. Now if you're new to the on one panel, you can access it from the window extensions menu here inside of Photoshop. Now this will work in Photoshop CS4 or CS5 if you have Plugin Suite 5. So I'm just going to select on one. That'll open up that little floating palette. And then I can drag this on top of any of the other windows or any of the other panels here in Photoshop. There we go. All right, now to access photo frame, I'm just going to double click right on photo frame. Now when photo frame opens up, there's two different windows. There's the preview window where we adjust the different design elements, and then there's the light table view or the library view that we're looking at right now, where we actually see our image in what looks like bridge or looks like a browser view where we can see all of the different design elements on top of our image. And it works very much like a browser. There's a scroller on the right hand side where I can scroll up and down through the content. There's a thumbnail size slider where I can change the size of the thumbnail preview. I can also hide out of the image so I can see just the frame on its own and I can select which background color I want to preview with either white or black. Now photo frame the name implies that it's just frames but it's a lot more than frames it's also backgrounds borders textures adornments everything you need except for your images to create great looking layouts and you can locate them by scrolling up and down on that long list or you can do what I do and use either the search field at the top or the category list on the left. To use that search field just type in what you're looking for. Maybe I'm looking for something that looks like ripped paper so I just type in rip and it automatically finds in this case 13 different frames that look like torn paper or I can browse through the categories. So let's take a quick look at some of the different types of content that live inside a photo frame. I'm going to start off in the adornments. Adornments are graphical elements that you can use to break up the background or to go over the edge of an image to hold it down. They can be these great little vector shaped squigglies like little floral patterns or grungy patterns that look more like tattoos or even scroll patterns. These are graphic elements that you can use in parts of your layout. There's also things like photo corners and scotch tape and thumbtacks that you can use to hold an image down to a layout. And I'll show you how to use some tape here as we go. There's also the backgrounds. Backgrounds are full complete images that you can use as a background behind a layout or that you can use as an overlay on top of it as well. And There's tons of different paper and metal patterns as well as these really great composites which actually blend multiple pieces together to create these really one-of-a-kind backgrounds. Hey Dan, someone had asked this earlier. Uh, if you ha Can you create your own images to add to this background? You bet. You can create all of your own content for PhotoFrame or convert content you have to be able to use in PhotoFrame. In the PhotoFrame user guide, it'll talk about how to put it in the right format for that to work. And then to add it here in the library, all I do is I just click this little plus button right down here at the bottom of the library and then point it towards a folder where those images live. Very cool just like that and then just point it towards that new folder of content and we're creating and adding new content all the time through our on one exchange website where you can share content you've created plus download the new things that we create all the time let's see what else we talked about backgrounds we talked about adornments there's of course layouts layouts combine all of these different elements together where it'll take a background a border a texture frames and adornments and give you completed layouts that you can start to work with right away it's a great way to get great results when you're still learning how to use PhotoFrame. And all of the design elements that are used to create these layouts are available as pieces in PhotoFrame so you can recreate them yourself. There's, of course, all sorts of film edges in the photographic category. These could be antique edges, brushed on emulsion, film from 35 millimeter to medium format to large format, slides, antique camera viewfinders, even antique Polaroid films like Type 55. And if we go to the Guru category, there's frames created by people like Jack Davis, Dave.
Dave Cross, Kevin Kubota, Vincent Versace, uh, Vicky Taufer, all sorts of different folks that use PhotoFrame in their studios have been very nice to share their content with the community so you can access their frames as well. All right, so let's get started. The first thing we want to do on a layout is typically to put a background underneath the image. So I'm going to go to the backgrounds, and because this particular image uh, has some great, let's actually take a look at the image here so we can see it. You can see how she's got some pink color in her hat, and she's kind of got a stocking hat on, so it's kind of a, a modern, think of like Soho, New York, Bohemian kind of a look. So I'm going to go to the Bohemian category. And in here, I've got some different background textures that I can choose from. I'm going to grab this one because it has some of those same pink colors in it. And then I just select the Add Frame button. I could also just double click on it. There we go. That'll add a background in for us. Now, that background by default goes on top of the image. We don't want it on top, we want it underneath. So, from the frame stack, just like I would in Photoshop, I just drag that background underneath. There we go. So that's a good start. Now we want to take the image and make it look like it's inside of an old antique piece of paper. So before we do that, I'm just going to change the size and the rotation of that image because if we have it right in the middle and have it be perfectly up and down straight, it's a little bit boring. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and you'll notice that when I have the transform or the move tool selected here inside of photo frame, I get those same little corner handles like I do on the free transform tool in Photoshop. This allows me to change the size and the shape of any design element including the image that I'm working on. So I'm just going to rotate my image to give it kind of a jaunty angle, make it a little bit smaller. I'm going to put it right in the middle of that paper. There we go. All right, now we're ready to make it look like it was printed on paper. To do that, we're going to go back to the library. So just click on the Open Library button right here at the bottom. If you have a really big monitor, multiple monitors, you can actually leave the library open all the time. All right, so we want an antique edge. So I'm going to go down to the Photographic category and select Antique. And in here, I've got all sorts of different antique mats and antique paper edges. Let's just scroll through until we see one that we like. I'm going to grab this one right here. Let's zoom in and take a little closer look at it so we can see it a little bit closer up. Yeah, that looks like a good one. I'm just going to, again, select it and select Add Frame. That'll add the frame in. You notice from the frame stack, it puts it on its own layer, just like it would in Photoshop. And as a matter of fact, when we apply this, send it back to Photoshop, each of these elements will still be on their own layers. So I can continue to adjust them in Photoshop or use layer styles or adjustment layers or any of the techniques that I'm used to using in Photoshop to continue to adjust these design elements. Now I want to size this to fit my image. So I'm just going to do the same thing I did with the image. I'm just going to make sure I have the frame layer selected. I'm just going to rotate my frame to about the same angle and then I'm just going to size it down to fit the image. And it'll take me a second here to get everything rotated and aligned properly. I need some background music here. I guess I could hum for you guys, but I'm sure I would violate copyright. So. There we go. Now I've fit the frame to the image. Let's add a little bit of a drop shadow behind it. That's something I like to do when I'm layering elements together to kind of give it a little bit more depth. And you can see this frame has a little bit of a dark edge shadow on it already. Let's add just a little bit more of a softer shadow around it. You can control the shadow by going to the shadow palette right here and then checking the on off toggle to turn the shadow on. Now it turned it on on the inside edge. I don't want it on the inside, so I'm going to select the outer option rather than the inner option. And then I'm going to select the manual offset tool. That's going to let me drag the shadow where I want it so I can pick which direction the shadow is going. 
Now, obviously, this is a really dark, hard edge shadow, and it looks very artificial. So to make it look more natural, we're going to reduce the opacity down. And we're going to go pretty low, only about 15 or 16 percent. And we're going to use the blur pop-up to soften it a little bit more. We're probably going to go around 20 or 30 for that guy, just to soften that shadow. So there we go. You can now see how that's cast, a nice cast drop shadow on that frame layer. The next thing we want to do is put some tape on the corners of that frame to really hold it down to the layout. We don't want to make sure it flies off. So we'll go back to the library again. Just click the Open Library button. That puts us back in the library. And in the search field, let's just type in tape. This will go out and find all of those tape edges for us automatically. Now here's a tip. If you look in the frames or you do a search for tape and you don't actually see the tape, change your frame background from white to black. Because if it's on white, white tape on a white background is kind of hard to see. So just toggle from white to black right there under the frame background pop-up. That'll make it a lot easier to see the tape. Another tip that I like to do is make sure that I have the none if realistic option enabled. That means when I add things like tape, there won't be any background color behind it. It'll appear to be clear and float on top of the image. Now we can scroll through the different tape. There's scotch tape and masking tape and artist tape that we can select from. Let's say we're going to go with some scotch tape to start out here. So I'm just going to grab some scotch tape and I'm going to say add frame. There we go. It's added our scotch tape. And just like we did before, I'm going to use the transform tool to adjust it to match the image. So we're going to rotate it to match the rotation of the image. And then we're just going to use the corners to scale it down to fit. Sure. There is. When you have it selected, so if I select the image right here and I go to the background palette, it'll tell me my size and rotation change. So the orientation was minus 14. So now if I went to my tape layer up here, all I do is I just make sure that its orientation is also minus 14 and that'll be the same angle of rotation. Let me just get this all sized in there right. Although I tend to just kind of eyeball it when I do it. All right, now that's not bad, except, you know, that tape is almost too subtle. It's kind of hard to see, and because we have a similar background color to uh, frame edge color, and because our image has this strong white background in it, I think I'm going to switch this tape to a tape that's a little bit stronger that will help mimic some of that white in the background. So you can switch frames, but keep all of their size and all of their background settings. When I to do that, just go to the library, pick a different frame that you want to use. In this case, let's use some white artist tape instead, like this one. And rather than selecting add frame, select replace frame. And when I select replace frame, it'll just switch the two out for each other, but keeps all their size and position options the same. There we go. That's looking pretty good. I think we'll make one slight little change. I'm just going to reduce the opacity of that tape just a little bit so I can see just a little bit of the background through it. Perfect, just like that. Now, when I'm ready, I'm just going to check my options, make sure I have the option set to apply each frame to a new layer. That'll put all of the elements on their own layers so I can continue to adjust them in Photoshop. I can also apply things as a layer mask or a clipping mask, which allows me to tear the edge of an image in a non-destructive way. It's also great if you want to create your own templates in Photoshop using the clipping mask feature. All right, I'm ready. I'm just going to hit apply. PhotoFrame is going to chew on that for a second and apply. And when we get back here in Photoshop, we'll have each of those elements on their own layers. 
Dan, when you hit apply, uh, if, if you're the kind of person who, when you're working after uh, everything you do, adding a frame, etc., you're, you're getting the habit of hitting the return key, does that take you to apply and kick you out of the photo frame program? It does. You can also use the return or the enter key, and we'll apply that as well. Okay. Is there any way to turn that off in case you were a habitual return key hitter and didn't want that to happen? <laughs> uh, that there is not. So I guess I need to put a little little stop sign on the on the return key. So it's almost done. Now it will also automatically save our work that we've done as a preset. So I could next time I go back into Photo Frame, it'll remember all the backgrounds, all the frames, all of the orientation, all the settings for me automatically. So if I made a mistake in here and I wanted to go back and adjust it, I would have that automatically saved preset for every, the last six things that I've done. Or I can save it as a preset so that I can use it over and over again, kind of like a template. And I can use it inside of Photoshop directly from the on one uh, panel. Or if I use Lightroom, I could even use it directly inside of Lightroom. All right, so that looks pretty good. The image is a little low, so let's just use the free transform tool in Photoshop to adjust its height. But before we do that, let's just notice what we came back with here. We have our original image still on its own layer, and above that, we have two groups in Photoshop. The under group has the background in it, and if I'd stack multiple items to create my background, I would see multiple layers in there. And above, there's another group, and inside of that, we have the tape on its own layer, and we have the frame on its own layer. So the image is actually left the same as it was. We haven't changed the image other than just rotating it a little bit. All right, we wanted to reposition everything on our canvas a little bit. So I'm just going to grab the upper photo frame group. I'm just going to hold down the command key or the control key on my keyboard. That way I can select multiple layers at the same time. And then just using the move tool here in Photoshop, I can move all of those together. If I needed to change their size or their orientation, I could use that free transform tool again as well. There we go. That looks good. Now the reason I picked this particular background is it had a little bit of that same pink color that was in her hat and her shirt, but it's not quite as vivid. So using Photoshop, let's adjust the pinks in that background to be a little bit more vivid. To do that, I'm just going to select the background layer in my layers palette, and I'm going to add a hue saturation adjustment layer. So let's just select Hue saturation from the adjustment layer pop-up. There we go. From the pop-up at the top, I'm just going to select, instead of master, I'm going to select the reds. And using the color dropper tool, I'm going to pick just the exact range of red that I wanted. Then I can just adjust the saturation and the hue so that it visually is closer to it. I don't have to be too picky about it, so I don't need to set any color control points to get it just right. It's more of a visual adjustment. So I'm just going to adjust the hue and the saturation slightly, just so it looks a little bit more vivid. There we go. Let's turn that on and off so you can see the difference. There's the original with a little bit more muted color, and then after. You see how it's really brought up some of those reds, specifically that run range to match our hat. Now, at this point, we would be ready to soft proof this to confirm our color before we printed it out. And Joe's going to show us how to do that. But before we do that, we're also going to show you how to resize this image to create a gallery wrap or a large print on canvas that we would create for the client. This happens a lot. We're designing in the context of the book, and the client loves that page in the book so much that they want to print for their wall of it as well. And rather than having to recreate this entire layout in Photoshop, we're just going to use Genuine Fractals to take the existing image information, increase it in size, keeping the detail and sharpness that we need, and add wings around the edges so that we can put it on canvas without sacrificing any of the image. First thing I want to do is I want to duplicate my image. So I'm going to go up to the Image menu and select Duplicate. That way I can keep my layered version of it at the original size. So I'm going to create a copy, and I'm going to merge it. So that creates a flattened version of the image. And now we'll send it to Genuine Fractals. Genuine Fractals is the gold standard when it comes to resizing your images. You notice when I open this, this is pretty small. It's about 24 megabytes. It's only letter size 8.5 by 11. Let's say the client wants a 20 by 24 print. 
that's a pretty big change in size. If I was to make that big of a change in size in Photoshop, I would lose sharpness and detail. But Jenny and Frackle's patented algorithms will maintain that instead. It's also a lot easier to crop and resize your image at the same time with Genuine Fractals. There's built-in document size presets for the most common square, photographic, paper, and video sizes, plus the ability to create your own custom sizes. So if you have a product in your studio that's not a standard size, you can create your own custom size. In this case, we wanted to do a 20 by 24. That's a standard photographic size, so I'm just going to select 20 by 24. And when I do that, you'll see how a crop box appears on the image because the 20 by 24 is a different proportion than the 8.5 by 11. I can now move in size and reposition that crop box to pick just the area of the image that I'm interested in. Just like that. All right. Now you notice this is a big change in size. This is going from 24 megabytes to 133 megabytes. From an 8.5 by 11 to a 20 by 24, that's over a 230% increase in size. Let's zoom in and take a look at the quality that we'll get with Genuine Fractals. I'm just going to zoom up to 100%, and I'm just going to adjust the navigator here. Now right now, you're seeing the original pixels in the image if they were stretched to make that size. You can see it's very pixelated. When I let go, Genuine Fractals will be applied, and you'll see the quality of the results. You can see how it keeps the texture in the skin and maintains the sharpness along the eyes and along the lips. All right, now one last step, because we're going to make this a gallery wrap, we're going to print on canvas. If you've ever done that, you lose part of your image that has to wrap around those wooden canvas stretcher bars. In most cases, for a gallery wrap, it's about two inches. That would actually cut into my image quite a bit. I would actually lose the corners of my uh, frame that I added, and I would lose some of these graphic elements in the background. So to protect that from happening, I'm going to use the gallery wrap feature down here in the bottom. All I do is I enable gallery wrap, I type in the thickness of those bars, usually want it to be a little bit bigger than the actual thickness, so if these were inch and a half bars, I would select two inches for the thickness, and then we give you four different methods that you can add those gallery wrap wings. You can either reflect them or stretch them, and you can also soften them at the same time. The method I use almost every time is stretch soft. I think that's the most natural look in most cases. That's going to take the edge. It's just going to stretch it a little bit and soften it so it's not so sharp. And it gives you enough realistic information that when it wraps around the edges, the client's not going to notice that it's different from the original image background. And then I would just hit the apply button to send those results back to Photoshop. Now that would take a minute or two, so I'm not going to do it today. I'm just going to show you what a finished version of this would look like instead. Here we go. <clears throat> Here's the finished version. Let me make this a little easier to see. At the bottom, on its own layer, is the image, and you'll see how it is now sized to 20 by 24. Let me turn some rulers on to make that a little bit easier to see. You'll see how the background outside of that, that's the part that would normally wrap around the image, is a solid color. That solid color is whatever your background color is in Photoshop. And what I like to do is before I go into Genuine Fractals, I'll just use the eyedropper tool to sample a color out of the background of the image. And then I use the foreground background toggle to make sure it's the background color. If I just leave it to defaults, I'll have a white edge around there. And depending on if your lab uses narrow, or excuse me, if your lab uses a 45 degree angle or 90 degree angle technique when they wrap, you might see a little bit of white. So it's always a good idea to set that background color first. And then on top of that, on its own layer, are those gallery wrap wings, where Genuine Fractals has stretched those edges to wrap around so we get a realistic looking gallery wrap out of it. Alrighty, so we've shown you how to retouch your images using photo tools. We showed you how to create a layout with photo frame and how to prepare a gallery wrap for printing using Genuine Fractals. Now Joe's going to show you how to soft proof it so that we can see what it's going to look like when it prints and how to build a custom printer profile so that you get accurate looking color on your printer. Wonderful, thank you Dan. Let me just uh, take over the screen here. And we will show my screen. All right. Okay. So thanks, Dan. That was great. Um, yeah. Lots of cool stuff. And and uh, you know, people have asked uh, um, many times. Oh, oh I, you know, the, I hear people say, "Well, I know how to do some of this stuff in Photoshop." And uh, so did Dan and I as well. We've been doing Photoshop for a long time. Uh, however, 
uh, time is money when you're when you're in business and you're doing this stuff for a living. And while I could reproduce a lot of the effects that are being done myself <clears throat> uh, with the on one tools, I can do in five minutes what might have taken me an hour in the past. And uh, the be the ability to fully edit images in five minutes rather than an hour apiece is why we're doing this. And it, it in addition with all the different frames and effects and things that are put at your fingertips it just gives you a little bit of creative inspiration having them all there uh, without having to think about it. So we've now got this wonderful image that Dan's created and I'm gonna take it and uh, make sure that what we get out of our printer or, or what we send out to our lab looks like it did on the screen. So first thing we're gonna do is create a custom printer profile and the, the big question is why? Well, the problem with some supplied profiles is they're an average for the type of printer you use. If your environment is very different than the standard environment where maybe that printer profile was created, for example, it might be much warmer or colder or drier or more humid, uh, your results might be slightly or in some cases wildly different than the factory profile. When you create your own printer profile, it's a true custom print pro profile specific to your printer and paper combination. Now you need a different profile for each printer paper combination that you use because paper stocks such as gloss and luster and matte and fine art accept ink very differently. And these different surface types have differing abilities to reproduce colors and tone range and densities. And in short, they have different color gamuts. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and create a custom printer profile and I'm going to uh, use the color monkey to do this. So let me escape out of here a second and go into the color monkey photo software. And I'm going to make this really fast. You should be surprised how quick this is. Uh, I simply click on profile my printer. Any printer that's installed on my system will show up. I'm going to choose my Epson 2880. And I've got, let's see, I did luster paper earlier. I've got some uh, Somerset Velvet here, which is one of my favorite fine art papers. So I'm going to call it CM Velvet Demo. I like to name my profiles that I create, starting with CM, because then they all show up uh, in my profile list together. So I click on Next, and it asks me to print out this chart. And just like when you do a monitor profile, I, I hope that you're all doing that, uh, a monitor profile sends up different colors to the screen, and then the device reads that and creates a profile based on the differences. Same thing's happening here. This chart is all known values, and the device will read them in, compare them to what it expected, and create a profile which basically is a set of corrections. Uh, so that when your printer is asked to print a certain color, that's what happens. For example, let's for argument's sake say this little patch here on the bottom of this first row is supposed to be 100% blue. When you read it in, let's say the device sees, well, it's it's got 5% red in it. That gets corrected for when the profile is created. So I already have my target printed. I'm just going to click Next, and it says go ahead and read the target in. Now, I've you can, unfortunately don't have live video here today for you, but I've got a little animation. It shows what I'm going to do. Simply, I take the color monkey, start on a white edge of the paper, hold in the button on the side, drag it across, and reach white on the other end and let go and repeat for each row. And that's really as simple as it is. And you can even go faster than what you're seeing here. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and do one. And as we're sitting here, I'll just click and drag. And there's one row. And if I mess up, like if I cross over into another row, what it does is it circles in red and lets me know to do it again. So I just again click and drag and this fast I can read in all the patches on this paper. Now it creates actually two charts and it creates the second one based on what it's learned from the first chart. So what it's doing is calculating uh, sort of a sort of an interim profile that will then get applied to a second set of test patches that are more subtle gradations or more earth and skin tones. And by taking this two-step process, it's able to create a much more sophisticated, much more uh, fine-tuned profile than if you just had one page with a bunch of uh, color targets on it. So I would then click on print. It says make sure you use the uh, same settings as you used the first time. I'm not actually going to print. I already have my print here. I'll just click on next. Now when you do do your printing, 
it asks you to wait. It has a drying process. Wait at least 10 minutes for the paper to dry. In most cases, the 10 minutes is fine. You may find that on certain um, fine art papers or you're using some kind of odd substrate that you might want to let it dry a little longer. And You can always do a print and then come back later or even tomorrow and actually read it in. But I already have my print dried so I'm going to click OK and then just like with the first one I just click and drag across each row and again this is how fast it is. You don't have to just stop and read each patch. You literally just click and drag starting to sound a little like Billy Mays. Um, <laughs> and we're done. That's how complicated it is to create a profile. So I'm going to get rid of this other stuff here. Oh, I will put in that it was uh, for my 2880, so I know which printer it came from. And I'll save that, and we just created a custom printer profile. So now I have a, an exact picture of uh, what my printer looks like and what it does when it's asked to print out a specific color. Now there's a couple of questions that you're asking. For those of you that are using RIPs, if you don't know what a RIP is, you're not using it so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but RIPs have their own way of doing things, so you do need to use a different device to do that. There's a system called the Iowan Extreme that handles RIPs. Uh, for those of you that are interested in the Color Monkey, then by all means go to xrightphoto.com and you can learn all about it. Okay, so it's done. I just click on Next. Uh, I'm offered the option to have it become my default profile and then I finish and that's it we just created a custom printer profile so now let's go into Photoshop and put it into work so here's uh, an image that Dan supplied of our uh, lovely friend Bethany on her custom background and we want to see how this is going to print before we actually print and that's what soft proofing is so I'm going to go up to view proof setup custom and this is how we soft proof and I get this window here so let's go to the profile we created and in fact here's the one we just did the velvet demo and when I click on preview watch what happens to the image behind see how it lightens up a lot that's because this is a fine art kind of watercolor like paper it's kind of a matte stock and matte papers typically lose a lot of uh, black density uh, and that's what we're seeing happen here. Now there's two rendering intents that you typically use uh, when you're when you're doing your proofing and that is perceptual and relative color metric. And in fact I want to jump out of here for a second back into PowerPoint and kind of show you a graphic that describes what those rendering intents mean. Okay so yes we are going to soft proof. Sorry I already mentioned this part and rendering intents. Okay, so what rendering intents do is they deal with color that is out of gamut. And f let's clear up exactly what gamut means. And since we're talking about printing, let's put it in printer terms. Simply put, a printer's gamut is the range of colors and tones that that printer paper combination is capable of producing. Now, since when we talk about a printer we need to include the paper as well because the papers have different abilities uh, amongst themselves. Typically glossy and luster stocks have the largest color gamuts, the greatest tonal range, while fine art and matte papers typically produce a more muted color than their glossy counterparts and that's why we need a profile for each of our papers. Now rendering intents are put in place to deal with out of gamut colors. Uh, again, more simply put for our uses today, rendering intents handle color that can't be printed on a certain printer paper combination. Now this happens fairly frequently with today's cameras. Uh, we can capture intense colors captured by our cameras that are just beyond the ability of our printer. These colors need to be moved back into the printer's available colors and that how that is done is determined by the rendering intent. So here we see kind of a graphic that shows uh, the black circle being the colors that the printer can print with some colors in this particular image that are out of gamut. So a rendering intent is going to take those colors and move them back into a printable space. Now if there are no colors out of gamut then the rendering intent doesn't have any effect. And this choice of rendering intent is somewhat subjective as we're going to see. Uh, so first of all, perceptual. Perceptual rendering uh, takes any of the colors that are out of gamut and it moves them back in while moving colors that were in gamut out of the way so that the relationship, sort of think of it as the spacing between colors, um, 
is maintained. Now the good thing about this is uh, it really is good for maintaining gradations. Imagine you've got a landscape with a, uh, a clear blue sky that's a deep blue at the top going lighter at the horizon. Uh, if you have a lot of other colors out of gamut, perceptual rendering will maintain that smooth gradation. However, even a little bit of color out of gamut can cause an overall tonal shift in the image. Now relative color metric does the same thing, takes the colors out of gamut. The difference is all of the colors that are in gamut stay exactly where they are. Now if you only have a little color out of gamut, this is usually fairly appropriate. However, if you have a large patch out of gamut, this can cause problems on those same fine gradations. Uh, since the, sometimes the relationship between colors has changed, there's no longer smooth gradations that happen. So you have to be aware of that. And again, one might work in some image uh, where another choice might work better in another image, and that's why you soft proof. So again, back to our soft proofing. I'll go to View, Proof Setup Custom. Again, we're looking at, uh, let's look at the Velvet Demo Profile that we just created a minute ago, and we see it's lightening up the image. Now let's take a look, that's perceptual, let's take a look at Relative Color Metric. And we see Relative Color Metric keeps uh, a much darker part of the, darker of the image. But maybe I like the separation that the perceptual has, has helped in the hair. So you have to make a choice here. The beauty is that I can leave this turned on and make adjustments to my image here in the layers panel and, and get my best choices. Now, uh, people often ask about these display options down here, this simulate paper color. Now, this paper is nowhere near this dim as this simulate paper color, so I don't typically touch these buttons. Uh, this is one weak part of the soft proofing process in Photoshop, uh, so I generally will leave this out. Uh, yes, the paper ends up being a little bit less deep than you see on the screen here because this is a matte paper, but nowhere near this bad. So my recommendation is ignore this. Now the fact that perceptual and relative color metric are different means that there is color out of gamut. Now I do like the overall tone of this perceptual better, but I want to bring a little density back. So I'm going to leave this on. And I'm also going to go view gamut warning. And that will show me the colors that are out of gamut. And no surprise here, this really intense pink uh, is the color that is out of gamut. Not really a huge amount of color out of gamut, but I still liked the way the perceptual rendering worked for this particular image. I do want to introduce a little bit of uh, contrast and, and tone back into the image. So let's go ahead and do that. Now first of all, again, we are looking at the proof colors, meaning we're looking at it through the profile. So I'm going to go and add a little curves adjustment to this. And I thought it needed a little bit more density back in the shadows. So just a little bit of a touch about like that. Again, I'm not sure exactly what you all are seeing because I don't know if you all have calibrated monitors. Hopefully you do. If you don't, you really should uh, pursue that. So that's good. Um, let's see, do I want to lighten up the midtones a little bit? No, we're going to leave that the way it is. Maybe a little smidge here. Okay, so I just created a curves adjustment for this particular paper. Now this might not apply to another paper. So I will name it accordingly and I'll keep it as part of my file so that if I'm going to print this image on velvet paper in the future, I know that I can turn this on and off depending on which paper I'm using. I could easily create another curve for a different kind of paper and leave that here as well. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little saturation back in. Let's take a look. Yeah, that looks good on my screen. And I'll do the same thing here. I'll call this saturation velvet. This just makes it easier next time I come back to this image if I'm going to then print this on say a luster paper I wouldn't necessarily want these uh, these fixes to be applied. So this is now good to print on my velvet paper. Now before we do this let's do one other thing. Let's check our color space. Now if I go to Convert to Profile, I'll get to see what I'm currently at. And this image is in the Adobe RGB color space. 
And that's typically good if I'm going to go out to, say, my Epson printer. But if I'm going to send it out to my lab, I need typically my labs are going to want it to be in sRGB. So I would need to change that. And we'll come back and do that in a minute. But first thing I want to do is get this image ready for my own printer. And there's one other thing I'm going to do. I'll show you one of my uh, kind of favorite techniques. I'm going to zoom in on the eyes here. Actually, I'll double click on the magnifying glass, which will give us 100%. And I like eyes and eyelashes to be really crisp. So I'm going to create a new layer. And if you've never used this before, it's a very handy tool. It's called stacking. And you access it by holding down, clicking on the flyout menu, which is right over here, and holding down Alter Option before you click Merge Visible. Now, if you just click on Merge Visible, it flattens your image. I don't want that. I want to keep all of my layers for later use. So if I hold down Alt or Option while I do this, what it does is flatten my image into a new layer while keeping all of my layers intact. Very handy to have because I'm going to sharpen part of this image, so I need to mask it out. So I'm going to use my favorite sharpening technique for faces, actually for landscapes as well. It's called Smart Sharpen. Now the settings I like to use as a starting point for most SLRs is 180% with a radius of less than 1 of 0 0.8 pixels. And you can see as I hold down the space bar, when I let go, how much sharper it makes the eyes and the eyelashes. I really like the effect that that has, so I'm going to hit OK. Now, however, the downside of that is I also sharpened up skin texture, which I didn't necessarily want to do. So I need to mask out this selectively. So I'm going to create a mask, which is done by clicking on right here, add a layer mask. However, I'm also going to hold down the Alt or Option key again when I click on this, because if you do that, that automatically fills the mask in with black. So now I've just hidden that sharpening effect. Now I'm going to get a brush. and Oh, another shortcut, by the way, that I didn't even realize existed until fairly recently when uh, my friend Eddie Tapp showed me this. Hold down Control and Option or Control Alt. And as you drag your mouse left and right, it changes the size of your mouse, of your, of your paint cursor, rather. By going up and down, it changes the hardness of the edge. Once you start using this, I pretty much guarantee you will never use the left and right brackets again. So I want my brush to be a little smaller than the eye. I'm going to make it nice and soft. And I'm going to work at about 50%. And since my mask is now black, I'm going to paint with white over top of the eyes to bring that sharpness back. And this is a cumulative effect, so if I continue painting over it, eventually I'd actually get 100%. I'll do the same thing for the lips to bring some of that crispness back. And I'll make the brush a little smaller for the eyebrows, and then paint over them to make them a little crisper as well. And now if I turn this on and off, you can see the difference. I've got really crisp, sharp eyes, and I really like the looks of that. By the way, if I also hold down Alt or Option and click on the mask, you get to see what it is you've actually done. Uh, and while you're on a mask, if you want to soften the edges of the uh, transition from, sharp to, from soft to sharp, you can actually go ahead and blur your mask as well. Not 27 pixels, that's a bit much. But by adding a little bit of blur to my mask, I can soften the transition there as well. Then I just click on the icon, and I'm back. So we can see we went from there to there. Now we've got a nice sharp set of eyes to send out to our printer. Let me finish the process for going out to a, uh, an inkjet printer on a desktop, and then I'll do one with going out to uh, a lab. So I'm ready to print this on my, la on my desktop printer. Now remember, if we go back to our View Proof Setup Custom, we have uh, our velvet demo paper. That's the uh, Somerset velvet paper we're going to use. And we decided, based on the edits we've made, that we like the perceptual rendering and do leave black point compensation on. So I click OK. Now I'm ready to print. So I'll go up to my File, Print menu. And if you've never done this before, the default setting in Photoshop is Printer Manages Colors. You don't want that to happen. If you leave that on, then all of the profiling stuff we've gone through and soft proofing was a waste of time. You've got to make sure that Photoshop is what manages the colors. 
The other thing you need to do is dial in the printer profile you're using and the rendering intent. So if I click on printer profile, I can scroll down and you can see the advantage of using some kind of code. You see all mine that are named CM are all in a row, so it makes it easier for me to find. So there's my Velvet demo profile and I decided I liked the perceptual rendering for this image and black point compensation on. Now by the way when we did the soft proof, remember there was that paper white thing that I don't think works very well. There's also a set of them here called match printer colors and gamut warning and paper white. I, these are fairly useless once again and they only affect this preview. They have nothing to do with the actual print. So again my recommendation is don't concern yourself with these. I've got hey Joe, we had a couple yeah. of questions about what black point compensation does. Black point compensation tries to match the density of the black uh, based on the profile uh, as deep as it can. And I have never come across a time when not having black point compensation uh, worked. Um, and you can see here, this, it says uh, it, it uses the full range of the, the paper's ability um, to to get as black as it can, um, especially. But if say if you see here, actually in the directions, actually in the in the uh, explanation that Photoshop offers, when you're converting from Photoshop's color space to the printer's color space, um, it's useful if one has a darker black than the other. And typically, if you're going out to a matte paper, your screen is going to have a darker black than the other. Uh, where if you're going out to a glossy paper, your paper is going to have a darker black than the other, than the screen would. So this kind of equalizes things out, that, so you get a consistent deep black that's going to match the image you saw on your screen. I hope that made some sense. I've never come across a yeah. point where not having black point compensation was a good idea. Uh, it's almost like they should have almost hide this. So anyway, uh, so we've got our Photoshop managing colors, we've got our profile, we've got our rendering intent, and the last thing we want to check is our print settings. And we do that through print settings here in our driver. And one thing you'd need to absolutely make sure of, and I had already dialed this in, is color settings need to be off. You don't want to have any color management on. If your printer driver tries to put its own color flavorings in, um, Epson has this uh, Epson RG, sRGB and Adobe RGB settings and you'll see photorealistic and saturated etc. As soon as one of those gets turned on it will start fighting with the profile you've created and the results are going to be wherever. There's no guarantee at that point. They're just Whenever they fight it's never a good result. You're taking control of the color. We've already seen the image on the screen how we want it to print and by turning this off that's what's going to happen. So then I can just click on print and unfortunately I don't have a printer you could all watch the printer pop out of. However, actually this morning before uh, I came into here uh, I did print out the image you see on your screen here on three different papers. I printed out on Luster, on uh, presentation matte paper, and on Somerset Velvet. And by using the profile and my adjustments, uh, with the exception of each paper's different ability to create a dense black, I have the same exact color tone and tonal range on all three of my prints and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, there may be some of you out there who prefer to print five times to get one good print. I like to get it out the first time. So uh, yes, you do need to choose your, your paper type in the print dialog box. Just make sure all your settings match the same thing they matched when you printed out your charts. So choose your paper, choose your resolution and uh, save that setting so that you can always access it later. Now, we've got our print out of our inkjet. Uh, Dan went through the uh, uh, trouble of creating a very large print to go out to a canvas wrap. So I'm also going to make a uh, save a copy of this to go out to my printer. So what I'm going to do is flatten this image. Uh, and remember I had already saved this as with all its layers. And I'm going to do first, remember our profile or color space rather. This is an Adobe RGB image which is fine for my inkjet printer but it's not fine for my lab. My lab prefers sRGB JPEG files and your lab may want something different. Make sure you, about, you ask them about that. I'm going to this time change my color space, my destination space to sRGB. So I just converted from Adobe RGB to sRGB and you probably saw 
a big change. I in that conversion, I lost some of my brightness, so I'm going to need to go fix that again. So I click OK. Now I'm back in an sRGB image. I'm going to add some pop back into this. Now I'll show you one of my favorite techniques for adding pop back into an image. I know we're running over a little bit late. Uh, hope you guys don't mind if you have to leave. The, as I, This is being recorded, uh, so you can uh, review this at any time. But if you don't mind, I'm going to go on a couple, couple more minutes just to show you a couple more cool things. Uh, here's what I do if I need to add pop to an image. And we lost a little pop going from Adobe RGB down to sRGB because this image had a lot of saturated colors which don't exist in sRGB. So I'm going to duplicate the background layer by dragging it to the little half turn page. I can either do that or hit Command J or Control J to duplicate the layer. And I'm going to change the blending mode from normal to overlay. Now this is going to be extreme at first, don't worry. Uh, it creates a very contrasty image, but I'm going to bring the opacity down much lower to something more like that. And if I turn this layer on and off, you can see we just got with that one quick little technique, a lot more saturation and pop into the image. And you'll find uh, if you use this technique for your uh, your landscapes in particular, it will really give them a lot of pop. If the contrast ends up being a little too much for your image, you can change from overlay to soft light, which is a more subtle effect, and maybe bring the opacity back up a little more. And again, as I turn on and off, you can see we've got an image with more pop. All right, so I like the way that looks. This is what I want my print to come back from my lab looking like. So I will then flatten this. Remember, we already converted it to sRGB. And I've got a flattened image now. I simply need to do a Save As. Save it as a JPEG. Already assigns the JPEG to the file. And I will call it to lab. Hopefully, you'll call it something that makes sense to you. Click on Save. I do want the maximum quality. Click on OK. So now I have an image that I've adjusted for that conversion to sRGB. I've got a full quality JPEG, and this file is now ready to go out to my lab. Now, JPEG, somebody asks if JPEG causes you to lose some color. Uh, color, not, not really, not very much. Now, remember the thing about JPEGs is uh, each time you do it, there's a successive loss of some detail and, yes, a little bit of color. But doing it the first time, especially when we went from a RAW to an Adobe RGB file, saving it as a JPEG that first time at high quality really doesn't cause you to lose much that you would ever be able to see. Um, you, do, you technically lose a little bit of quality, but for the first time, I would defy anyone to actually be able to see it. Uh, and somebody asked why JPEG versus TIFF. Well, most labs want a JPEG. Uh, that's what their machines are set up to print from. They want an sRGB JPEG. If your lab wants a TIFF in Adobe RGB, great, send them that. Uh, but I find that most of the commercial labs that I deal with, especially for the wedding portrait work, want that calibrated sRGB JPEG file. And what I can tell you is that my labs, by going through this color workflow, having my sRGB JPEGs, I get back albums, books, canvas wraps, and prints that match my monitor every time. So that's what we're all after. We don't want to have problems. We don't want our prints to come back dark. We want it to look like they did on the screen. And if you follow these guidelines, that will happen. So let's get out of Photoshop and finish up because we're running out. We've actually run out of time, so let's continue. So let's summarize all the stuff we've covered, even going back to last week a little bit. It's important that you think about your color right from the start. Before you do any of this, before you do step one, you've got to make sure your monitor is calibrated and profiled because your monitor is where you're making all your decisions. And if it's not right, then any decision you're going to be making is going to be based on wrong information. And if you're real serious about editing, consider investing in a good monitor. Secondly, if you're doing your own printing and you're very serious about it, uh, creating a custom printer profile may give you a much better result compared to the factory ones because it's an exact picture of how your printer and paper is operating. Soft proofing in Photoshop, very important to do because you got, you got to see how much of a change there was 
on this particular Adobe RGB image when we went out to different papers. So having a soft proof in place lets you see how that's going to happen before you actually do that print and you can make adjustments to head it off. And to sum up everything we've seen, we've in two weeks, in two hours of time, uh, we've seen a lot of great effects and image enhancements uh, possible with the On1 Plugin Suite 5. And these tools can take your image from good to something that's extraordinary and has a lot of impact. And that's the increased value that you're adding to the work that you do. And then to ensure that your prints match this beautiful image you've created, you got to follow those steps. Monitor calibration, get your color right from the beginning, make sure you're doing your white balance in your camera. If you haven't looked into camera profiles, take a look at that as well. The Plugin Suite 5 will give you an incredible set of tools to enhance your images, follow the soft proofing process, and then you can either print yourself or send your print out, prints out and be assured that you're going to get back what you saw on your screen. So on behalf of X-Rite and On One Software, we'd all like to thank you for spending time with us uh, today, and especially uh, if you were spending the entire two sessions with us. We thank you for your time and attention. Uh, please visit the websites when you get a chance. There's a lot of cool uh, educational information there. And we look forward to seeing you all online again soon. So thank you all. Have a great rest of the week. And Dan, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Goodbye, everyone.